my name is Katherine Kalaitis, and I'm the resident scholar and director of academic collaborations with the National Hellenic Museum. And you're about to watch my conversation with Professor Christopher Woodhouse, 6th Baron Tarrington. Lord Tarrington had a successful career as a urologist, but today he's here to talk to us about his father, Montague Woodhouse, the 5th Baron Tarrington, who was a British soldier and politician and an important figure in the Special Operations Executive, the top secret British organization charged with spying, espionage, and reconnaissance during the Second World War. The Fifth Baron spent the majority of the war, or a large part of it at least, in Greece, where he came into contact with George and Helias Dundalakis, who are the subject of the National Hellenic Museum's recent online exhibition, link in the bio. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Lord Tarrington, a fascinating and engaging look into a son's memories of his father's really sort of mythic career. Once again, thank you so much, Lord Tarrington, for agreeing to come and, and talk to us about your father and his, um, his war service and his sort of relationship to Greece. Um, we're, we're absolutely thrilled um, to have you today. Um, yeah. Very kind of you to ask me. No, this, this is quite an honor for us. So um, I guess a good place to start is always with um, people's educations. And um, your father, in my, to my understanding, read classics um, at, at New College at Oxford. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. Um, so is there anything you'd like to share about that? Um, anything sort of antidotal stories from um, that, that you remember being told or something to that extent, or um, he was just sort of from the generation where people read classics, right? Yes, uh, certainly in, in, in his day, in what we call public schools in England, that is um, paid for schools, uh, the brightest of the bright uh, did classics at school, that's to say ancient Greek and Latin, and then went on to Oxford or Cambridge to continue the same at Oxford, um, they were called greats, which reflected the, the way that they were held in esteem. Um, and he was very bright and did very well and won lots of prizes, but he also played tennis for his college. Um, and although he told me uh, that he was well aware that war was coming and it seems to have been obvious to pretty much everybody who thought about it. Um, he was aiming for an academic career and what he would have done had there not been um, the war um, would have been continued in his academic studies. Um, he would have uh, become a fellow of All Souls, which is a, a, a postgraduate college which for which entry is by highly competitive exam, but he would then have become a, a, a teacher of classics at Oxford. That's actually very interesting. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I sometimes you notice know, when people read classics, you don't realize that doesn't always mean that they have that kind of same level of interest. And it sounds like um, he did, but. Um, that was derailed, as we we all know, um, by the war. And um, he was he was commissioned in 1940, if I'm correct, right? Um, and when he in September of 42, which would have been um, sort of the year after the Battle of Crete, um, the 80th anniversary is um, the 80th anniversary. The beginning of the Battle of Crete actually is tomorrow, from when we're recording this on on May 20th. Um, for the for the people watching at home, um, and he so he ended up um, he ended up serving. My understanding is for for most of the war in Greece, um, and something as I was doing my own research that I came upon that was a little bit puzzling to me, and maybe you have the answer. Um, my understanding is he was one of the few British um, officers in the country who spoke Greek, and I was wondering if you knew where he had learned modern Greek uh, in Greece. Um, oh. He, he'd always been a Philhellene. <laughs> and um, when he finished at Oxford, uh, he went to um, Greece uh, to 
have some peace and quiet to study from for his um, exam for all souls. And um, he learned Greek there. He was very good at learning languages. He, he could read most European languages and speak several of them, but obviously Greek. Um, I don't think that he was completely fluent by the time the war began, um, but um, he was certainly, certainly had a very good grounding in it. Um, the, uh, when the war began and he went back to England, rather surprisingly, it was rather difficult to get into the army. You, you couldn't just sort of turn up and say, here I am, I'd like to join the army. Um, and he had to pull a few strings with his political family to um, get a commission in the Royal Artillery, um, which he got in, in Oxford. And uh, then, as you say, he uh, went to Greece with the military mission at the very beginning of the war, which um, ended in retreat to Crete. Uh, which is why he was in Crete at the time of the German invasion. He escaped from Crete in the way that luckily most of the British did. Um, and only in 1942, having been trained in SOE work, he went back to um, Greece for Operation Harling. That's, so that's actually, that's really interesting that he was sort of um, first, it's interesting that it was difficult to get into the army in World War II because you would think, well, I suppose the commission, but you would think that they would be desperate for, for manpower. Um, but that, that's really interesting. I know you had said um, when we were talking earlier um, before we started recording that there wasn't much mention of Crete in his autobiography. Um, was there anything that sort of, came, I know, and I know people, I know people of the war generation didn't talk about the war much. Um, but is there anything sort of, are there any stories from the war that you remember being told? I, I've no idea why we know so little about uh, his time in Crete, because uh, his time in Greece, he was very happy to talk about, and there were several television programs about it, and he wrote about it. Um, but as I said, his autobiography um, has the evacuation of the military mission to Crete. Um, he was apparently uh, taking a message to uh, Field Marshal Freiburg, who was the uh, Allied commander in Crete. And Freiburg invited him to stay for breakfast. And while they were having breakfast, uh, my father saw a lot of parachutists coming down and wasn't terribly sure whether to mention this or not. He was a <laughs> junior officer compared to Field Marshal Freiburg VC. Um, but eventually he did and Freiburg looked at his watch and said, mm, dead on time, typically German. <laughs> and um, at the time, um, my father was very perplexed about that. But with hindsight, uh, having learned about things like the decoding in Bletchley Park um, and other sources of intelligence. Um, he obviously realized that Freiburg knew the invasion was coming, knew the time that it was coming, and knew that he had already made as much in the way of preparation as he could with the very limited sources at his disposal. Um, and um, so then, as you know, there was uh, um, the defense of Crete, which was rather up and down. In his autobiography, he says that it was a, there were several battles and in some we were winning and in some we were losing, but eventually, of course, we lost and retreated to, um, in, in his case, the Kora Safakion um, with most of the troops who managed to escape. Um, the other story that he, he did tell me uh, because it was at a time when I was going to um, lecture in Crete, in, in rather in um, on my subject, and Mitsotakis was the prime minister, 
Um, you probably know that Mitsotakis had been in the resistance in Crete and had been imprisoned and was released um, in an amnesty. And um, the German general at the time was General Bauer. And uh, Mitsutakis, um, more or less by accident, met him in the street in Heraklion. Um, and Bauer invited him in for a cup of coffee and so on. And um, Mitsutakis asked why he had been chosen to um, be released instead of being shot. And Bauer said, well, I am well aware of your brilliance and I know that one day you're going to do great things for Greece, which um, ended up with him being prime minister instead of being that's, shot. That's incredible. That's, um, thank you so much. That's, that's a really interesting, that's really an incredible story and kind of um, certainly why, why um, Cairo and I um, enjoy doing doing these these kind of these kind of interviews. Um, so the other um, little bit that I um, picked up in my um, it, as I was getting ready for this for this interview that I, I wondered if you would talk about is that um, it's sort of interesting to sort of sort of an interesting image for me is that during his time not only in Crete but but in Greece generally. Um, from what I understand, your father was sort of an imposing figure. He had a ginger beard and sort of, um, I, I would love sort of to know more about, you know, sort of walking among the Greeks. That's not exactly an inconspicuous figure among Greeks, correct? <laughs> yes, it, it, even he was perplexed by that. It, it, he looked extremely un-Greek, except for a huge amount of, of hair. But of course, as you said, <laughs> was ginger. Um, it, it wasn't ginger in later life actually and, and um, none of his children were ginger and it's usually a, a rather strong gene but um, <coughs> he looked very un-Greek and I, I think that his, his principal defense um, was that an awful lot of Greeks, whether they were part of the resistance or not, um, knew perfectly well who he was if they ran into him but of course, the huge majority of them were anti-German and um, therefore didn't uh, say anything about it. He said that um, when he had to go down to Athens uh, from the mountains in Epirus, uh, he walked as he usually did a lot of the way and then got on a bus. And um, uh, quite a lot of people um, sort of looked at him in a rather peculiar way and but when they got to Athens and he was getting off the bus the bus driver said to him in English good luck thank you so I think that that was the defense and um, the Germans as far as I understand it um, didn't really leave their billets very much they, they stayed in the big cities um, and their expeditions into the mountains weren't terribly successful. Uh, so they probably um, hadn't got a very clear idea of what the sort of classical Greek man would look like. I guess, yeah, that, that's what it, and I certainly have heard as well that, um, you know, from, from, my, from my own family even, right, that the Germans um, weren't, either interested or terribly successful in getting out of the cities and into the mountains. Um, if for no other reason, then you have a lot of people who have centuries of experience in guerrilla mountain warfare living up there who are probably not um, the easiest to deal with. So, um, but your, your father was, um, had, I think we could say an incredibly successful war. Um, if there's such thing as a successful war, um, he was awarded the DSO and um, he was appointed, he was made an OE, OBE, um, which for our largely American audience is an, is an officer of the order of the British empire um, in 1944. Um, and so then after the war, um, he came home to, well, first he actually went and worked as the second secretary at the British embassy in Athens. Is that correct after the yes. war? Yes. Um... I mean, that was uh, largely a cover for uh, trying to help with the constitu new constitution and uh, the elections uh, that were supposed to uh, establish a 
a, a nice democratic non-communist government after the war. Um, and so I, can't, I don't know who sent him. Um, it, was, it was on the cusp of there being an election in the UK, but I think that whoever was in government at the time sent him. Was, was your father then there sort of at the beginning of the Great Civil War? Would that be correct if I'm using No, I, I think he'd come back before the real fighting began um, because he married my mother in 1945 um, uh -huh. in um, August. I'm pretty sure it was August. Um, and uh, I think he must have left Greece before the fighting began. Because in fact, he he, I think he took my mother to Greece for their honeymoon, also on the basis of um, supervising elections. Um, How um, romantic! Well, <laughs> I suppose so. Yes, they had they they were there for quite a long time because they had a, um, a, a a little cottage that she talked about. Um, just outside Athens. So I think that must have been a very happy period for them and certainly before the fighting had begun. Okay, that's, um, yeah, no, that's, it, it's hard, I think probably maybe for those of, certainly in my own sort of um, personal sense of modern Greek history, those things just sort of blur together and we forget that there was this period of, of hope that there was going to be this sort of democratic um, government in Greece? Well, after um, the Gorgopotamus, the Operation Harling, um, it, it had been planned that he would remain in Greece um, to uh, try and establish a Greek resistance movement, because he, he was part of the SOE, the Special Operations Executive. And um, he, he wrote and often told us that he spent a huge amount of time trying to prevent civil war even before the Germans had gone, because oh. the um, uh, nationalists and the communists were at loggerheads um, even before Operation Harling, but, but certainly afterwards. So I think that everyone must have been aware that civil war was a possibility. And one of the things that seemed to be necessary to try and prevent a civil war was to have a plebiscite on whether the monarchy should be restored. Um, and uh, by, I think, a narrow margin, the people voted to restore the monarchy, but nonetheless, the civil war did break out. You know, and I think that, um... You know, so my sense of that is that even that that referendum on the monarchy was just so ridiculously close, right? It just showed the divisions within the society um, more. I think we tend, I don't know, I, I guess maybe this, this might be um, November speaking a little bit for me, but I think we tend to think of elections as ways to sort of get things over with and sort of heal conflicts. Um, but I wonder if frequently they just um, just expose further whatever conflicts <laughs> exist in a society, right? Like they just then you sit then you're sitting around when, when it's a close election, you're sitting around wondering which of your neighbors it was, right? Um, so when your father, so he returned to to the UK in the in the early fifties, if I'm correct. Um, and then went to work at the British Embassy in Tehran. Stop you because you see, I'm, I'm afraid you're wrong there. He, he didn't um, oh. go back to the UK in the early 50s. He, he came back to the UK um, as soon as the elections were over. So okay. he, he, was, he was back in the UK, I would imagine, by certainly the end of 1945. Um, oh, okay. And his, what is, has always been something of a mystery to me is what he did between, um, let's say, the beginning of 1946 and uh, 1950 when he went back to Greece. And he again says in his autobiography, says in his 
autobiography that he couldn't settle down to the academic work which would have taken him back to Oxford um, and many of his um, friends were, were doing that and establishing their um, academic careers. And um, he seems to have had a number of jobs which he occasionally would refer to. Um, he was in the film industry for a bit with um, a Greek American um, film mogul called Scorus, um, which he didn't, I mean, he loved Scorus, um, but he didn't like films very much. And then he <laughs> worked for Lord Nuffield, who founded the Morris motor car industry, um, but who was a great philanthropist. And uh, I think father was advising him on how to support um, academia. And it, it's glossed over in about two pages, which cover his marriage, um, my birth, my younger brother's birth. Um, <laughs> and um, that's about it. Uh, so he didn't go uh, back to Greece until 1950. And that actually, in terms of what happened afterwards and skipping around the various um, embassies that you were talking about, it was, it was extremely uh, seminal for him. Would you like to talk about that more, um, sort of in terms of, first, that's really interesting because that, that really wasn't in um, a lot of the sort of, I think, secondary material that I read. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, no, you're quite right. It's not in anything. It, it's, it's, it's stuff that's really come to light um, as more secret papers are released, because, of course, in those days, secret meant secret. And uh, if you were in the SOE, you didn't say what you were doing. Well, um, probably in 1948, uh, he'd been asked to join MI6. MI6 was the Secret Service um, uh, organization for um, overseas spying. And, I was going to say a real James Bond. Yes. One of the more recent books um, on uh, the Cold War describes him as a dashing spy of the old school. <laughs> when, when I read that, I, I realized he, he had clearly been a spy, but I don't think anyone would ever have said he was dashing. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so no, I've seen some pictures. But, um, <laughs> when he went back to Greece, uh, he fell in again with. Um, a long-standing uh, Greek spy stroke uh, resistance worker called Yanni Peletekis, uh, who obviously was a very influential individual um, in my father's life. Um, he persuaded father that the civil war in Greece having been over, and the communists, of course, lost. The fact remained that the communists were the biggest danger to world peace, which of course many other people in the 40s had decided as well. And so um, he decided that he would take up the offer with MI6. Um, but uh, again, this is not written about until much later, and one can only piece it together because he never talked about it. It, it. There's nothing about it in his um, uh, autobiography, but there was a department of the uh, Foreign Office called um, the Information Research um, Department, which had been set up to um, create anti-communist propaganda. And they were very secret and very few people, even in the government, knew about it. And um, he persuaded MI6 and presumably the IRD that um, not only was the communist infiltration the most significant problem, but that um, in what was then called Persia, uh, the 
communists were probably the most active and important Cold War enemy, and that the uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh should be destabilized um, to remove communist influence, and the role of the Shah increased, and, and that's why we all ended up in what was then called Persia. That's really interesting. And I think you're quite right that this is, I think, maybe a history because it's, it was, you know, it was intentionally secret, right? Um, it's this sort of history that's just now um, being being uncovered. And so your, your father was at the, the British Embassy in Tehran during the, the 51 coup. Am I correct in saying that? Um, no, by the time the coup had occurred, um, he'd left. Um, we, um, that's to say, myself and my little brother but, and um, our absolutely beloved nanny and my mother and father arrived in, I think, probably the beginning of 1951. Um, and of course, I was six, seven then. And uh, so, as far as I was concerned, it was much nicer than England because, at least in the summer, it was warm, and in the winter, um, it was bright and crisp, and it snowed. Is where I first learnt to ski, rather surprisingly. Um, and um, school was pretty limited, so it was a lovely place for little boys, and there was no rationing, um, especially of sweets, because we still had rationing until 1954. Um, but again, looking back on it and reading the autobiography, uh, a lot of the family were there to cover for various bits of spying. And uh, some of the coup was set up, but then Mossadegh broke off diplomatic relations um, after about 18 months, and we had to quickly escape back to, um, to England. But the, the coup occurred a, a bit later and was directed in part by Kermit Roosevelt, um, who was Teddy Roosevelt's nephew, I think. Um, and the English representative was called Derbyshire. So the, he'd gone by the time the coup that uh, deposed Mossadegh occurred. Okay. Do you, do you have any memory, I mean, of, of escaping? It sounds like you have quite happy memories of, of Iran, but do you have any, did you have a sense at that age of it being dangerous? Or this isn't, you don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, but that's sort of interesting to me. It was one of the most exciting events in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, am I? Um, yes, we, we left, um, on an aeroplane, of course, which was extremely exciting, as I'd only ever been on an aeroplane <laughs> once before, and I'd been sick the whole time. And um, the we had the whole first class compartment to ourselves, ourselves, because we thought to be that important. And we landed in Damascus on the first night and stayed in the British Embassy in Damascus. And it was the first time in my whole life that I'd been allowed to stay up for grown up dinner. <laughs> and until it sounds like it worked out for you <laughs> well absolutely but uh, I mean it, although we I came from an absolutely lovely 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 family meals were fairly ritualistic and you didn't come down to dinner until you were 13 and um, so I've always had a very soft spot for the British Embassy in Damascus um, the next day we got as far as Geneva where we stayed with somebody else who I can't remember and arrived back in England on, on the 30. That's how long it took to go from Tehran to London or, or vice versa. That's, that's, it was, it was very exciting that's kind of staggering and um, in its own way. Um, yes, so, I mean, on the way out from London, the first night we got to Rome, uh, the second night we got to Lydda, which um, is in Israel. And the third day we arrived in Tehran. That's, oh wow, that's, and I, I was complaining because it's going to take me, I have an extra layover on my way, on my way back to Denver. So <laughs> thank you for putting things in perspective for me. Um, 
so when you when you return not i guess not right away but when your father returned to england he had he had a political career um through through the late 50s and um and early 60s um he was in the macmillan government is that correct yes again with with hindsight it's clear that there was more spying um because he didn't uh, go into parliament until 1959 um yeah and uh, the IRD, um, which was very closely linked to the CIA, uh, published a magazine called Encounter, and this was another means of providing um, sort of pro-Western, anti-communist propaganda. Um, it was funded by the CIA, and uh, Father's precise role in it is not absolutely certain but uh, according to uh, recently published books it seems that he was responsible with the cia for setting it up and for uh, coercing many left-wing uh, intellectuals in england to write um, suitable articles whether they knew that they were writing for uh, a magazine aimed at communist propaganda is also not known, but they were very clever people. And I, I, I think it's most likely that they did because they weren't necessarily communists. They were social democrats or socialists. And so um, writing to show that a, a sort of third way between the rampant capitalism and uh, Stalinism, uh, which would be social democracy, was a good thing. And this magazine was distributed uh, throughout the Iron Block, uh, the Iron Curtain Block. Um, and he uh, was running that uh, for the IRD. And uh, he was doing various other things why i have no idea but as you said he, he seemed to appear in south korea and the far east and um the united states at a time when travel was slow um and expensive and difficult um, and that's he was doing something for I mean, uh, presumably the foreign office you know i mean that's I and mean, that's the reason that led to my my forest gum comment was you know when i was um, this weekend as I was sort of you know searching through different papers and things you know there'd be like they were having a dinner at the White House and he came to see Eisenhower or he was you know like you said in South Korea and it just seemed like he was sort of appearing at all these um all these sort of key events um in the years after the war um which was sort of sort of interesting I, I agree with whoever said a, a dashing spy of the old school I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that um characterization um really honestly after all that parliament sounds a little boring <laughs> <laughs> um, yes I, I i think it probably it could have been could have been i'm not sure that my mother really liked it very much um <laughs> both sides of the family um had strong political links and um my mother uh, my mother's first husband, uh, who she married in 1931, uh, was killed during the retreat to Dunkirk, uh, and she had three children with him. And then when she met my father um, at the end of the war, she was significantly older than him. But it was a, very much a love match, but she always told us that she only married him on the absolute condition that he never became a colonial governor or an ambassador and <laughs> she, she didn't really enjoy the sort of social life that um went with those sort of occupations was it your pat maternal grandfather the governor of bengal is that correct um my maternal great-grandfather was the viceroy of india oh okay and his son my grandfather um, was governor of Bengal, and um, when the uh, 
Viceroy became ill, he became temporary Viceroy. And uh, so um, governing the empire was definitely a family occupation. And in fact, when I, I wanted to be a doctor all my life, ever since I could ever remember. But when my grandmother, um, my mother's mother discovered, she says it, she said it was an absolute disgrace because for her, governing the empire was pretty much the only worthwhile occupation. That's no, that's 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 really interesting. I think um, the sense of of that. I mean, that really your mother then really had a sense when she said, I don't want you to do that. She really had a sense of what she was rejecting, as it were, um, in terms of, of the of obvious social obligations and stuff that come with that. Um, she was a so very liberal individual and uh, she, she certainly had difficulty with what she found in India when they were living there because she was in her teens and uh, early twenties then. And um, she had great difficulty in coming to terms with the contrast between um, the way she was living in Government House in Calcutta and the way the servants were living and the way the population of India at, at large lived. Yeah, oh, that, I mean, that makes, that makes complete sense. Um, it also makes sense then that, that Parliament was a good, a, a good compromise, um, as it were. So, your your father leaves um, leaves par leaves the the Commons um, for the last time after the October seventy four election. Yes. And I know I'm glossing over one of the most fascinating periods of British political history <laughs> right there, like the year of three prime ministers. I'm aware of that, but <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I won't. Um, for American audiences who don't know how interesting this is, watch The Crown. It will kind of fill you in on that. Mm. Uh, I watch The Crown. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how Americans are learning about the history of your country right now. We're, we're doing the best we can. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, of course, you've got Downton Abbey as well. Da Downton Abbey is very, very important to this. Um, actually, the book that Downton Abbey is based on, American Princesses, is an incredibly good book. Um, yeah, it's re it's really it's about the um, the members of the British aristocracy who married American heiresses. Um, oh, right. Uh, well, I wonder if it has a different name in the UK because I I have read that uh, or a book of that on that subject for sure quite recently, yeah. but it wasn't called that. Um, anyway. Yeah, and it's I think I think it's a really interesting um, um, sort of yeah it's a really interesting. I'm very, I'm a classicist by training, but um, I'm super interested in like Edwardian British mm -hmm. history. <laughs> so um, if, I, if I had another life to live, that's probably what I would do. Um, so yes, we are glossing over a really interesting period in, in British political history. Um, but after it, if I just sort of pair up the, his, his, bibliogra his bibliography with leaving, um, with leaving Parliament, with leaving the Commons, um, it looks like a lot. Most of his sort of serious writing happens after he leaves Parliament. Is that fair to say? Um, not really. I mean, I agree that there was some very important writing then, but um, his nineteen uh, forties and fifties books um, on Greek themes, I think were also very important. I mean, they're, they're all being um, retranslated and republished in Greece, as I mentioned to you in one of the emails. But um, the struggle for Greece, and uh, I think is still very widely read. Um, and um, One Omen, which was um, a very lovely book about um, the Greek character, shall we say, but I quite agree that, that an awful lot of it was written after Parliament because he had much more time to do it. It's serious was the wrong word. He, he does, he does, I, I guess what I intend to say was he did a great, he does this great deal of writing, sort of returns to the Greeks, yeah. um, which actually based on the earlier part of our conversation in a strange way makes sense to me um, in terms of initially sort of thinking he would pursue an academic career um and sort of returning um returning to the Greek so this would have been um really in, in your teens and and things 
Um, do you know why he sort of focused on Greek themes? Or was it just because that's sort of where, what he was known for? Or was this about some sort of genuine interest? And was there a conscious decision to write on modern Greek themes as opposed to classical themes? Um, well, I absolutely no doubt that Greece was his passion. And, and if, if ever there was a Philhellene, it was, was him. Um, and of course, his spectrum was quite wide in terms of dates. Um, I mean, the Battle of Navarino, for example, um, was a, a lovely book. I, I, I really enjoyed reading that. Uh, the Phil Hillians itself. And then um, there were uh, one or two others. I just, yes, the, the, um, the sort of spectrum of um, timing. Cappadistria, uh, 1973, um, the um, uh, book about Pleithon, uh, the last of the Hellenes in eight, 1986, um, Belastinlis um, from the Greek Revolution. I mean, th th these were, I think there was a, a very good wide spectrum of biography um, and um, history beginning with the, the struggle for Greece. Um, and the civil war, uh, the sorry, the war of independence. Now, and just just for as a sort of um, personal note, the rise and fall of the Greek colonels um, was one of the books my grandfather um, had at his ready on the bookshelf. My my Greek grandfather um, that he found that he thought was sort of the best. Um, the best sort of recounting of the rise and fall of, of the junta. So, um, which was kind of, my grandfather had some esoteric interest, but yes, yeah, so that was um, just, just, just as a note, my, my grandfather was a, was a fan of your father's work. Uh <laughs> well, that's very nice to hear, thank you. Um, well, the rise and fall of the Greek colonels was uh, a very interesting book and a very interesting experience. Um, my father took um, myself, my mother, and my little sister to Greece in 1967, I think it must have been. Um, and theoretically, it was a, an Easter holiday for us, and we climbed up Nicobetus with our candles and so on and had a very nice time. And we drove around Greece, and a great deal of the time was spent by father having um, chats with his old friends from the mountains in Greek. And all the time he was actually um, recording what was what their views were of the colonels. And we were followed apparently by secret policemen, but <laughs> certainly they, although they were secret to me, they weren't secret to him. Um, and the, when the uh, colonels discovered uh, what he was actually doing. They tried to confiscate the tapes, but he managed to get them to the British Embassy and out in the diplomatic bag before they got them. Um, and one of the most interesting things, I think, from my point of view, was his observation that many of the people who he had known in the mountains in Greece during the war as part of the communist resistance, were actually then functionaries in the colonel's government. Um, and he concluded from that that um, if you were once a totalitarian, you were always going to be a totalitarian. It didn't greatly matter which end of the political spectrum it was. And indeed, probably the left and right wings uh, politically were a circle meeting round the back. Um, <laughs> Papu George would have agreed on this assessment, <laughs> this yes. assessment. Yeah. Um, and when he, he wrote an article in The Observer who'd paid for this trip. And um, when I read it, I thought, my goodness, you know, the colonels aren't quite as bad as all that. And I discussed it with him. 
And um, his response was that, of course, anybody who knew me, that's to say knew my father, would know exactly what he meant. But <laughs> I think that somebody who didn't know him um, might have thought that he wasn't totally opposed to the colonels, but of course he was. I mean, he was extremely opposed to the colonels, but um, and, and I think that's very clear from the book. No, 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 and I think, um, you know, my, my grandparents were obviously already um, in the States when, when, the, when the junta came to power, but um, I think my, my grandfather in particular was, was very interested um, in, in what sort of what had happened. And I think he came to, I think he appreciated your father's book because he had come to this conclusion that if you had this kind of totalitarian impulse within you, you were gonna have a totalitarian impulse yes. within you. And um, ideology was the window dressing of that, of that yes. impulse. Yeah. Um, so I, I have word from, from the um, disembodied voice who governs us, maybe God, maybe Cairo, um, that we have, we have taken over 40 minutes of your time. So um, we'll, start, we'll start landing, landing the plane, um, if that's okay with you. First, is there anything else um, you're, you would like to say? We really appreciate you doing this. No, well, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to have been asked. and. Um... It's a shame you haven't been able to tell me more about Helios. Um, <laughs> I've, I've done a bit of homework on him, and he, he seems to have been an absolutely wonderful um, individual, just the first sort of person one would like to have met and talked to and learnt about his time in Crete and his escape. Um, but um, I'll, I'll leave that to your exhibition. And yes, his, his son um, actually was incredibly generous um, with us in terms of donating um, his archives. And um, we're very, very excited um, to be able, um, not only to put on this exhibition, but there, there are th we'll be able to use um, what's in those archives, you know, going forward for, for a very long time. Because um, I think this is, I mean, it's an incredibly um, fascinating story, right? What happened. Um, what happened in Greece in the war years and, and immediately after. Um, but I also think if I can have some, a moment of editorial as it were, um, I think stories like the Dindalakis brothers um, and like your fathers are important because I think it's important um, to talk about the, especially the audience that we largely reach, you know, with, with school children and things. Um, in terms of talking about um, the real sacrifices that were what what um, victory in the war cost. Yes. And um, as I think there are totalitarian impulses um, afoot, um, and I think it's important to to keep reminding people um, why why that victory. Um, almost 80 years ago was was so very important. Mm. Um, so I, I really appreciate you um, sort of taking taking this time. Before we let you go, um, I have one last question. What is your, what has been your engagement with the classical world and with the Greeks? Um, clearly you had a father who was a great Philhellene, but is there um, is there anything about the Hellenic tradition that has captured you? I know you've had a very brilliant medical career, um, but is there a little room for Homer? Uh, well, um, you couldn't really escape from um, <laughs> classics when I was at school, um, and you, you had to have got um, Latin O-level to get into medical school. O level being an exam you took at about uh, 15. Um, and it was compulsory. I went to the same school as my father, and it was compulsory to do Latin um, up until that time. But actually, I wasn't very good at it. Um, and I was even worse at Greek, which I did for a couple of terms. The, um, but growing up in his household, which was absolutely lovely, and we had much, much, much privilege. Um, but Greece was always there. I mean, he, he broadcast um, on the BBC Overseas Service to Greece. We had 
a Greek newspaper that arrived, I, th I think probably every month, it was presumably a, a, a Greek newspaper in Greek, um, which had some nice stamps on it. And I think every yeah. month, which was, which was presumably a digest of what was going on in Greece, um, he went there often. There were the programs on television about the Gorgopotamus. So Greece was completely central to um, my childhood and my view of the world and my view of um, how we had got to the sort of civilization that we had. That's lovely. Lord Tarrington, thank you so, so much for your time. This has been absolutely wonderful. Um, and when we are all allowed to fly back and forth without long quarantines, and if you find yourself <laughs> in the great city by Lake Michigan, please let us know. Um, we usually like to take our speakers out for dinner at the very least. So <laughs> consider yourself owed a dinner in Chicago. Okay, um, <laughs> lovely. Thank you so, so much. Not at all, thank you, Katie, goodbye.